questions. Um, my name, as I said a minute ago, is Alexander von Rosenbach, and I am the interim director of the International Center for Counterterrorism here in the Netherlands. And I'm very excited to welcome you today to what is the third installment of what will be uh, a long running uh, def definitional piece of work for ICCT, um, dealing with uh, prevention and preparedness uh, with a focus on prevention of preparatory acts. This event is of course, part of the much broader piece of work led by Professor Some technical problem, mm -hmm. Alexander. We don't have your voice. Your photos is frozen. So maybe Professor Smith, you can maybe finish um, uh, introducing your hand a bit. <laughs> Assuming that I'm uh, audible and visible. Good afternoon. Good morning, wherever you are. Uh, this is the presentation of part three of the Handbook of Terrorism Prevention and Preparedness out of five parts. I assume that many of you have been present uh, when we introduced uh, parts one and two. This part is about the preparation of preparatory acts and uh, there will be seven chapters we discuss uh, either in this main audience or in the breakaway room. Preparatory acts are, of course, where the prevention has to take place. For instance, uh, the 9-11 Commission report identified 23 preparatory acts that would have been visible if people had their eyes open. One of them, for instance, was an Arab flying student who said, I'm not interested in starting and landing, just flying that should have raised an alert light with the flight instructor, but it was a missed opportunity and so were 22 others. And whenever a terrorist event happens, like we had one in Vienna a couple of months ago, the guys go across the border and buy ammunition and then that is reported to the Austrian authorities, but they do nothing with that information. That's a missed opportunity at prevention. So today we go through a number of uh, areas where prevention plays a role, financing of terrorism, uh, weapons acquisition. One area where the original author, uh, General Ioannis Galatas could not be present today because his internet connection at home is so uh, shaky is chapter 17, and uh, while I will introduce my own chapter uh, later, I would like to say a few words on the prevention of uh, CBRN materials and substances falling into the hands of terrorists. And perhaps I can ask Antoinette to put up the PowerPoints uh, that Brigadier General Galatas was kind enough uh, to send uh, to her so that you can follow that. You will see all these things later in uh, a recorded uh, YouTube uh, version. So if you can't follow it, uh, as I have to rush full the material, we have only one and a half hours, be uh, assured that these things will be available on the net. And of course, the chapters of this part three are all available online. So can you go to the first uh, or second of these PowerPoints, Antoinette? Well, these are basically the areas of concern, the CBRN, uh, you're all familiar with that. Uh, most of them have to do with disruption rather than uh, with destruction. And uh, we go to the next uh, one, which is, uh, so far, we have been lucky with a few exceptions like Aum Shinriko in uh, Japan and, of course, ISIS in Syria. Can we go to the next slide, please? Yeah. Uh, as you know, in Syria, this is the presentation of my own. Uh, okay, we leave it at that. Can you go one back, uh, 
that way you see the pictures on the right side. Uh, as you know, in Syria, not only the government has been using uh, chemical weapons, but also the Islamic State. And in fact, only last month, a primitive factory of ISIS has been uncovered. They use it to produce chloride gas, which they put on suicide trucks that they run into Kurdish and other positions. They are also experimenting with uh, mustard gas. So it's something that is uh, real. Uh, can we have the next slide? But at the same time, uh, Al-Qaeda tried since the 1990s to get hold of uh, nuclear and radioactive materials, and they paid a lot of money in Sudan and elsewhere to be scammed by things like red mercury. So the motivation to have such weapons is very high. The capability with most organizations is very low. That situation, however, cannot be like that forever, and we have to be prepared. Can we have the next slide, please? The problem is that so many things that are of military use are also of civilian use, and sometimes existing uh, materials are only one chemical step and process away from uh, being turned from a civilian uh, object into a military object. Uh, on this slide, you can see there are more than 32,000 scheduled chemicals that have the potential to be used. And for producing uh, common explosives, there are also about 4,000 uh, items on the market that uh, can be used or rather abused. Can we have the next slide, please? The international community has created a whole network of agencies uh, that uh, has to stem the proliferation of such uh, CBRN uh, technology. But unfortunately, this refers to states and not to non-state actors. Next slide, please. There are a couple of new things on the block and one of them is a drone technology uh, not so long ago. A drone landed in uh, Tokyo on the prime minister's office uh, with uh, some, I believe, uh, biological agents. Uh, this was more a warning shot, uh, but uh, nevertheless, drone technology is changing uh, the game. While the payload of drones is still limited for major uh, carriage of explosives, uh, what the Houthi attacks and uh, attacks uh, allegedly also supported by Iran show that this is one uh, vector to bring uh, chemical, nuclear, perhaps also biological agents like anthrax in a soccer stadium or some other things. The internet, of course, is full of uh, manuals on how to uh, prepare a bomb in uh, the kitchen of your mom. Uh, many of these instructions are flawed and probably many of those who dabbled with uh, them uh, hurt themselves. But it is one of the problematic sides of uh, the open society and an unregulated and largely lawless internet that such instructions are out there. Next slide, please. Well, uh, there's many ways of getting at uh, such uh, weapons. I kept for a while uh, chronology of trafficking incidents uh, and got easily to hundreds of incidents where radioactive, uh, highly uh, radioactive materials in small quantities uh, and others were smuggled, for instance, from the southern border of what used to be the former Soviet Union. There's also another threat that uh, as the anthrax attacks in the United States in uh, 2001 made clear, the insider tracks, scientists going rogue. So there is much uh, that needs to be watched uh, in order for prevention to work. Next slide, please. 
Yeah, can you go to uh, the next one, uh, Antoinette? Well, I think <coughs> I leave it at that, but what I can recommend to you is the monthly bulletin that uh, Brigadier General Galatas produces uh, and is freely available on the internet where he lists uh, whatever happened in the last months in terms of uh, near misses or upcoming dangers. The CBRE uh, diary is uh, an insider uh, recommendation if you want to keep up to date. But uh, have a look first at his chapter, which is now online and which gives you a good overview of what I tried to summarize here in a few minutes. Thank you for your attention on this one. I pass back to Antoinette. Alex, yeah, do you I want can hear to... you. Yeah. Sorry, Alexander. Yeah, sorry about that, everybody. I, uh, as is the sometimes the norm here, I've had a unexpected technical problem, um, but glad to be back. And thanks for that uh, introduction to uh, the CBRN chapter. I think quite an interesting one indeed. Unfortunate uh, that the author wasn't able to join us today. Uh, I want to um, not make up too much time here and move quickly into the presentation. So I'll just give a, a little bit of uh, housekeeping notes um, around what we are expecting to do here. So uh, as I think you saw on the panel um, invitation uh, or the, the registration form, we are gonna divide into a main room, which will be here in this setting, um, which will focus on the prevention of movement of funds, people and weapons. And that is for chapters 14, 15 and 16 of the handbook. This session will be moderated by my colleague, uh, Julie Coleman, who is ICCT's program lead on prevention and countering of violent extremism. And uh, we will also take participants over to a breakout room where we will discuss in a parallel uh, the theme of prevention of extremist ideology and information, which is uh, drawing on the author contributions from chapters 13, 18, and 19. So uh, in those groups, we will spend hopefully eight to 10 minutes uh, from each of the panelists and then have a robust Q&A session in parallel. And then we will rejoin uh, in a plenary session for closing remarks at the end of the event. Along the way, of course, feel free to use the chat function to post questions. Uh, we will use those, uh, bank them and use them in the Q&A session to, to get engagement directly from you. And that's often in our experience here where we get the liveliest and, and most interesting insights out. So please uh, don't be shy to, to put your thoughts out there for us. Um, and I'll lastly stress, although I think Professor Schmidt has already mentioned that this is a recorded session, meaning uh, if you don't uh, able to join the whole thing, or if you hear something in one workshop uh, in one breakout room, but you would also like to follow the authors in the other, you can go to ICCT's website and there uh, follow the live recording, which will stitch together both of these events, uh, the parallel events um, going on for, for later audiences. So please do so. Um, I will, I guess, leave it there for now, and we'll let Antoinette and uh, my colleagues on the event side work our magic to distribute everyone into the respective places, and we'll start with the, the content from the panelists. Okay, it looks like the, the numbers of participants are going down. So I think that's a sign that we are successfully breaking out into the two separate groups. Um, so uh, without further ado, I think we'll go ahead and get this session started. Um, slightly more uh, housekeeping, I think um, just to start the session, I will go ahead and introduce our three uh, distinguished panelists, give you a, a brief introduction and bio of each. Uh, then I will turn it over to the panelists to make their remarks, um, after which time we will have a, a Q&A session. And as Alex emphasized in the first um, session just a moment ago, please feel free to submit your questions through um, the, the Q&A function or the chat function, and that will just help us if you can do that sort of as the presentations go along and we can start to compile and organize questions um, so that we have everything set up for the panelists at the end. Um, and one last note is uh, after the Q&A session, uh, we'll be merged back together and there will be some concluding remarks, I believe from Professor Schmidt. So if you're able to stay around till the end, please do so. 
So uh, to introduce the, the panelists that we have, and, and thank you very much for the three of you in joining this session today. I think we're all eager to hear your remarks in addition to reading your chapters uh, that are part of the handbook. So first speaking today will be Jessica Davis. She's an international expert on terrorism and illicit financing. Uh, Jessica began her career in intelligence analysis with the Canadian military. And her last role in government was as a senior strategic analyst at CSIS, where she was responsible for threat financing and managing the indicators of mobilization to violence project. Uh, Ms. Davis is now the president and principal consultant with Insight Threat Intelligence and works to bring evidence-based solutions to the private and public sectors to counter illicit financing and terrorism. Uh, second today, we're, we're pleased to have Dr. Sajan Gohol speaking on his chapter. Uh, he has a multidisciplinary background in global security issues, and his current research includes looking at the ideologies and doctrines that feed international terrorism, the varying tactics and strategies of transnational political violence, border security challenges, and the role new media plays uh, for strategic communications. As International Security Director for the London-based Asia Pacific Foundation, which is a policy assessment think tank monitoring emerging geopolitical threats, uh, he acts in the consultancy roles for law enforcement agencies, foreign ministries and defense departments, multilateral organizations, universities, NGOs, and the international media. And our third and final speaker for this session today will be Dr. Mahmoud Cengiz. Uh, he's an assistant professor and research faculty member with the Terrorism, Transnational Crime and Corruption Center at the Shar School of Policy and Government at George Mason University. He has international field experience delivering capacity building and training assistant to international partners in the Middle East, Asia, and Europe. So with that, I will go ahead and hand it over to you, Jessica. Uh, please feel free to go ahead and start. Thanks, Julie, I appreciate that. So I would want to take a second though and thank Professor Schmidt for inviting me to write this chapter and ICCT for bringing this whole thing together. I'm in really illustrious company and it's a huge undertaking if anybody has been following the release of the chapters to date and there's still much more to come. So the nice thing about this is that the chapters are open access. So I'm not gonna spend a lot of time going through all of the details of my chapter. I'm just gonna hit a few of the highlights um, and then talk about where we need to go next in terms of prevention of terrorist financing. So this chapter aims to provide an overview of the global framework that exists right now for preventing and countering the financing of terrorism. Um, but before I get into that, I wanna talk a little bit about what terrorist financing is because it's one of those terms that gets thrown around a lot but is really rarely unpacked. So financing, terrorist financing, is how terrorist groups, movements, cells, and individuals uh, raise, use, move, store, manage, and obscure, or hide or launder their funds for terrorist purposes. So these purposes could be for maintaining an organization, conducting terrorist campaigns, supporting cells and attacks, or even as small scale as for cells and individuals. And within each of these financing mechanisms, there are many ways that terrorists act. So for instance, they raise funds from criminal activity or from other terrorist groups like terrorist patrons. They move money through cash couriers, the formal banking system, hawala, money service businesses, et cetera. And they often need to store their money for future use. A lot of them do this in cash, while others may have bank accounts or store their funds in gold or even in cryptocurrencies. They use their money to acquire terrorist goods as well as normal goods. So if we draw on conflict economics to understand that, we can consider the idea of terrorists acquiring guns and butter. Um, every terrorist group, cell or individual has a budget that they need to use to get either their normal goods, which are you know, butter, sustenance, or their terrorist goods, which are weapons, components, operational security measures. Terrorists also need to manage their funds. So for cells, this may be something relatively simple. So when they're plotting attacks and things, but they often, even in relatively simple attacks, there'll often be one person who's dedicated to the role of money manager. While for organizations, this may include something like a committee. A lot of the time terrorists are fighting against internal corruption. So it's quite common and easy for money to just go missing. And so they set up these structures to manage those funds. And finally, terrorists need to hide or obscure the source and destination of their funds and ultimately 
how they want to use those funds, which is for terrorist activity. They can do this through some simple measures like using cash couriers, or they may employ many more complicated schemes. So as you can see, terrorist financing itself is rather complicated, especially when we start to think about what all the mechanisms involved are. And correspondingly, terrorist counter-terrorist financing policies and practices seek to address a number of those activities. So what does counter-terrorist financing seek to do? I would say that for the most part, counter-terrorist financing policies and practices try to prevent terrorists from acquiring funds in the first place and ultimately trying to prevent terrorist activity. When terrorists do manage to get funds, counter-terrorist financing policies and practices seek to use financial intelligence to detect their current activity and their future capabilities. In terms of counter-terrorist financing preventing upstream terrorist activity, that's part of the framework that was set out for this book, um, you know, this generally is about preventing the formation of a terrorist group or cell. And counter-terrorist financing initiatives don't do this directly. Instead, they aim to restrict the financing of a group. So they may prevent an organization from being able to expand and execute attacks, but they won't necessarily stop a group from sort of striking its initial formation. They may, counter-terrorist financing policies and practices may prevent the creation of terrorist cells and restrict the amount of money available to would-be attackers. However, we have seen adoption and evolution of terrorist tactics in the financing space to react to counter-terrorist financing policies and practices. Um, one of the ways that this has happened is through the self-financing of terrorist activity. So we've seen that through the use of student loans and personal funds. This has evolved as a sort of workaround against to evolve through those counter-terrorist financing policies and practices that have restricted for instance, a terrorist group's ability to fund a terrorist attack directly outside of its immediate area of operations. This can be really frustrating from a counter-terrorist financing perspective, but I also like to consider it something of a measure of success because terrorists who have to resort to self-financing because of fear of detection are less likely to be able to mount more complex attacks or hit hardened targets. In terms of midstream prevention, this is some, somewhat more difficult because many of the sources of terrorist funds are impervious to counter-terrorist financing initiatives. For example, rent-seeking activities like we see in Somalia, um, like taxation and extortion, don't have an easy counter-terrorist financing practice. Um, in this case, the counter-terrorist financing measure would be to reduce the territory available to a terrorist organization which is a much broader counterterrorism issue. Terrorist groups also adapt to those counterterrorist financing initiatives, as I mentioned. Um, part of that is through seeking to avoid the use of the formal financial sec sector that is relatively heavily regulated and has pretty good measure uh, activities in place to, to detect terrorist financing. And they do that again through using things like cash couriers, which are still popular to this day, or trade-based mechanisms to move funds. They adapt to rules and possibilities for detection by using things like nominees, including um, things like female names or female facilitators to evade detection. So it's a constant game of cat and mouse that goes on in the counter-terrorist financing and terrorist financing space. And then from a downstream perspective, I think it's fair to say that there are very few, if any, plots or attacks that have been detected solely based on financial intelligence or counter-terrorist financing policies and practices. But this is a bit of an unfair metric, because if we use this metric, counter-terrorist financing may not look like it's actually worth the effort. Um, but it's a poor measure to consider one counter-terrorist practice on its own, um, since they do work together. And the same thing goes for when you consider different types of intelligence, including uh, financial intelligence or signals intelligence or human intelligence. Everything has to work together, so you can't really evaluate them on their own. We also know that the use of financial intelligence in investigations is increasing, and this can help to determine the level of planning and preparation of terrorist cells or individuals intent on undertaking terrorist activity. It can also help to time interventions and disruption and understand the capability of terrorist groups, cells, and individuals. So some critiques of counter-terrorist financing have argued that they've achieved very little on their own, uh, and to a certain extent this is true, but they don't work alone. They work together with other counterterrorism practices, which of course makes measuring the impact of each one of them, including financing, more challenging. In terms of what we know 
There are many international organizations that work together to enhance global efforts to counter or prevent the financing of terrorism. These, of course, include the United Nations, the Financial Action Task Force, the Egmont Group, etc., and a number of non-government organizations that provide analysis and technical technical assistance to upskill countries' ability to prevent the financing of terrorism. We also know that policy transfer happens with and through these organizations from states that set the policy, so powerful states, to those that accept the policy, often through coercion, like the FATF, Gray, and Blacklists. What we don't know, and 20 years after 9-11, there's still a lot we don't know about counter-terrorist financing policies and practices. And one of those things is what they really achieve. You know, whether these efforts are worth the costs, both in strict financial costs in terms of implementing these global norms and standards, but other costs as well, such as impact on civil society. We also haven't done a great job of measuring the negative externalities of counter-terrorist financing policies and practices, such as impact on human rights, civil society, and political repression, which we're seeing more of where some counter-terrorist financing approaches are being used to counter political opposition. And there's also now an increasingly difficult challenge that we're facing, which is how to effectively counter terrorist and extremist movement financing. You know, there's a really big difference between countering the financing of a structured group, seller, individual, and broader extremist movements that are much more nebulous, have really diffuse sources of funding, and even sometimes the funding isn't necessarily um, transparent or the impact of it isn't clear in terms of the movement itself. So the way I want to leave this today is this. The logic of counter-terrorist financing is straightforward, and I believe that it's sound. Reducing funds available to terrorists must be part of a collective good. Logically, it must have some impact, but we really don't know what that is. And more troubling, we really don't know, empirically speaking, what the impact of, pol impact of counter-terrorist financing policies and practices are. Thank you so much, Jessica, for, for your presentation. And I really look forward to discussing some of these things more with you during the q and I mean, I think even particular one of your last points, uh, mentioning that there's still so many unknowns within this, uh, this zone. And I know, I think in your chapter, you mentioned that uh, on the date of 9-11, this was a very nascent field, um, but it seems like there's still many uh, issues to be resolved and to really be examined. Um, okay, so, so next we'll turn to Dr. Sajan Goho uh, for his presentation, please. Thank you, Julie. Uh, so I'm going to just uh, share my screen. Uh, so hopefully everyone can see my PowerPoint. <clears throat> okay. So hopefully that's clear for everyone. In case it's not, please do let me know. Great, thank you. So firstly, let me again thank Julie for the kind introduction. Let me also thank ICTCT for inviting me to speak. Um, I also want to acknowledge uh, Professor Alex Schmidt for being the one to get me to write uh, this particular chapter on prevention of cross-border movements of terrorism. Uh, he's known me since I was a student. He has been my mentor. I'm slightly sad that he's in the other group and has abandoned me, but uh, hopefully he can see this on, on YouTube later. So when it comes to border security, there are many different issues that come into play. Some are somewhat controversial, some are challenging. Uh, there are various geopolitical, economic issues. There's issues over intelligence, of information sharing, conflict, uh, and lots of things also connected to history as well. The legacies of colonialism. For the case studies that I looked at, or the ones that Alex Schmidt had asked me to look at also, one was the connections of, of people traveling between Europe and the Middle East and back and forth. There was also Europe and Africa. The US-Mexico border was one that also was asked uh, to, to, to look at. Pakistan and India, as well as Pakistan and Afghanistan, which perhaps is most topical right now, especially when it comes to issues with the Taliban. And the last was the uh, Israel-Palestine uh, dynamic. So all of these have various different challenges, problems, issues, conflicts, uh, sometimes other dynamics come into play. What is common is this thing about FTF travel, foreign terrorist fighters, walls being built, the topography, the geography as to how people can move, uh, 
What are the physical obstacles? Are people coming through normal uh, ports, airports, seaports? Are they crossing borders illegally? All these different issues uh, come into play. When it comes to border security in particular, one of the starting points to assess is the UN uh, Security Council Resolution 2396, which was issued back in 2017. Now the purpose and the theoretical goal of this was to identify measures that were aimed to help nations prevent terrorists from moving across borders uh, illegally. So various different things came out of that. Uh, screening measures at borders, enhancing identity management. There was also increasing the collection of passenger data and biometrics, which is so important with the advent of technology. And the third, which is something that keeps coming up, I think in any topic to do with counterterrorism is sharing of information among states, but also uh, within states and the different uh, law enforcement and migration agencies and intelligence communities that are, are there. When it came to looking at how terrorists are traveling, there were various different areas that I wanted to, to look at. Terrorism often can be tied to the supply of weapons, narcotics trafficking, as well as human trafficking. They tend to also operate quite, quite obviously where there are conflict zones and where there are safe havens for them to uh, plan to plot. So some of the examples I was mentioning earlier was to look at things like the travel uh, of, uh, of illegal smuggling routes from say Central America into the United States. There is no clear evidence that terrorist groups are specifically doing that as yet. There have been instances where an individual who will become a terrorist later on may have come through that route, but it was not specifically for the purposes of carrying out terrorism. Sometimes it's become a very uh, political topic as you can uh, imagine. The other aspects would be through uh, Western Africa, the Sahel into North Africa, the Maghreb, and then across the Mediterranean into Europe. There have been examples of terrorists using these routes as have the connections in East Africa and the Horn of Africa that have also then traveled across into uh, Europe. The example that I was mentioning earlier about Pakistan where there's been terrorist traffic into Indian administered Kashmir as well as into Afghanistan. Some of that then would spread across through uh, the Persian Gulf into Turkey and then uh, through Greece and then again into Europe. So these are some of the travels that one was observing to see whether terrorist connections uh, were directly uh, operating with criminal enterprise, how terrorists were traveling and what routes they were actually taking. When it comes to FTF travel, there were three questions that I was asking in my paper and also to border security people. What do we need to be monitoring each day at an operational level? What information can be shared to benefit border security in their daily work? And the third was what routes are we seeing mostly used by air, land and sea? Now, when it comes to the FTF case studies, you see people traveling for terrorist training purposes, as well as for plotting attacks. There's also been post attack travel. And another term that I call slinking returnees, that tends to be where an FTF is hoping to come back to their country of origin uh, because the assumption is they may have been assumed to be dead. And there have been some interesting examples of that. If we look at FTF travel, what I noticed in my research was that immigration agencies and services can actually play a very important role. In many ways, they are the front line when it comes to curtailing that travel because they can play the role of intelligence, and also potentially agents of enforcement. And there's this sort of a cycle of, of effect where you have migration, where terrorists are trying to smuggle themselves in, there's border security, and if that fails, there's the attack that can unfold. And we've seen this cycle repeat itself in a number of case studies. The problem tends to be is that when there is a global crisis, a humanitarian crisis, and terrorists want to try and smuggle themselves in within the, the, the humans fleeing a, a conflict zone such as Syria. They basically then act as the invisible enemy within that. And I think it's important to point out that 
the people that are traveling and fleeing their homes because of persecution and wars, they have no connection to terrorism whatsoever. And unfortunately, some incidents have demonized the whole issue about people that have become stateless. And terrorists exploit that uh, very fully. So one of the most, uh, I guess, uh, well-known examples was the uh, Paris attacks in 2015, where you had some terrorists that used the migrant trail to come into uh, France. A couple of them were stopped in Greece, but two others using uh, forged passports uh, carried out the suicide bombings at the Stade de France, causing the Germany-France match to be suspended. Others using the same route had also carried out the attack at the Bataclan. And we also know that in the case of Belgium and the attack at the airport there and at the railway station that other terrorists used similar routes. So when it comes to the institutional, operational and technological aspects in terms of curtailing terrorists or trying to foil them from traveling across borders, obviously walls tend to be identified as a very important step in, in doing that. There is the other aspects such as intervention forces, surveillance vehicles, UAVs, radars, thermal cameras, control centers, lots of sophistication. Problem is, is that not everybody has access to it. And even then you need to have somebody who has the, the gut instinct, the wherewithal to utilize the most uh, effectiveness of this. Interestingly, one other thing that has severely impacted or eroded the ability for terrorists to travel to a degree has been the coronavirus. Uh, COVID-19 has had a role to some degree, although it does look like terrorists are trying to get around that. When it comes to cooperation, there are three focus areas that I would talk about. One is capacity building, two is government partnerships, and three is interagency partnerships. These are extremely important, especially when it comes to dealing with FTFs and their potential travel. This plays a role when it comes to, for example, battlefield intelligence and military to law enforcement utilization of information. We know that FTFs have committed horrific crimes in places like Iraq and Syria, where they have murdered Muslims and non-Muslims, uh, such as ISIS, for example, being involved in murder, illegal detention centers, torture, war crimes, recruiting child soldiers. The evidence that often comes into play could be things like social media, communications, video, photographic evidence, encrypted messaging, but that requires these three aspects of capacity building, government partnerships and interagency partnerships to work together. When it comes to specifically the issue of security, technology, as I was mentioning earlier, is important. So you could have fingerprint registration, criminal record checks, biometric identity systems, advanced passenger information, as well as passenger name records. But again, one of the problems that keeps coming up is the efficacy of these metrics. It depends on the quality of the content in the data and various databases. So you can have a database, but then they also may be restricted by locale, agency, and bureaucracy. In terms of barriers to do with better cooperation with immigration agencies, there are four aspects, I would say. One is interoperability, two is cultural, three is awareness, and four is capacity. These are the sort of four challenges. Other barriers to multilateral cooperation there is substandard information sharing sometimes, inability to comprehensively uh, control the borders. Sometimes it's reactive as opposed to proactive. There are these weak control mechanisms, operational, management, and physical. Lack of training, technology, and poor intelligence tends to be uh, an obstacle uh, as well. And sometimes, unfortunately, there is complicity or negligence from state institutions. A couple of examples I just give before I conclude. If you look at the Afghanistan-Pakistan border, which is I think a major talking point right now about what does the West do with Afghanistan? History plays an important role. The Duran line that separated the Pashtun community on either side of Pakistan and Afghanistan has often been a source of grievance and conflict. We know that the Taliban operating in Pakistan has crossed over very often to carry out attacks in Afghanistan. 
And if you look at the map here as to who controls what district, what part of Afghanistan, it is very complicated. Some are controlled by the government of Ashraf Ghani, some by the Taliban, some actually now by the ISIS affiliate, ISIS KP. And the problem is, is that because there's a lack of border control and security, these attacks continue uh, without any stopping. Now, Pakistan has been building a wall across the, the Duran line, but that hasn't really dealt with the problem. And also there's been accusations about the fact that terrorists and also Taliban fighters are able to cross without any sanction. The last example I just give as some sort of concluding thoughts is that even during coronavirus, we are seeing terrorists traveling. So the case of the Tunisian individual, Brahim Oisi, he traveled back in September uh, from Tunisia bound for France on, on, a, on a boat. He arrived in Lampedusa, the Italian island, on a smuggler's boat. From there, he was transferred to Bari, uh, where he was quarantined. Upon release from quarantine, he was served with deportation orders, but he chose uh, not to return, even though he was requested to. He then traveled from Bari to Paris, where he spent a little time there. And it seems that that is either where he was communicating with terrorists or where his, his radicalization process happened. Because he then traveled to uh, Nice in October of last year, where he carried out the attack at the Notre Dame Basilica, killing three people. This is a man traveling again during coronavirus peaks, during the issues of a travel logistics and everything else. So the last points I want to leave is just a reminder of what I was mentioning earlier, that what are the issues that need to be monitored each day on an operational level? What information can be shared to benefit frontline border security in their daily work? And what routes are we seeing used most frequently by air, land, and sea? So I apologize for going over my uh, uh, time, and I'll just leave my details there. I know there's a Q&A later, so I will uh, end my presentation. Uh, so Julie, over to you. Thank you very much, Dr. Goho, for your, your fantastic presentation. And it really struck me when you mentioned the, the issue of the returned uh, FTS who carried out the Paris attack in 2015, that even over five years later, this sort of issue of border security and migration uh, still remains as relevant uh, and as of, uh, you know, a, as much of a pressing issue as ever. Um, and I hope, yeah, in the Q&A, perhaps also given your, your case studies from very different regions around the world to sort of explore how some of these considerations maybe play out depending on the, the particular context. So thank you very much. Uh, and last, uh, we will turn over to Dr. Mahmoud Chengiz. Uh, please take the floor. Thanks, Julie. Uh, good, good morning and good afternoon, wherever you are. And uh, Julie, thanks for introduction and thanks for inviting me to this great event. It's been really an honor to be part of this great project. I think in addition to funding and financial resources, people, people's movements over the borders and uh, the, also there is one more indicator showing us the capacity of terrorist organizations, which is arms and uh, explosives used by these organizations. That's why in my chapter, chapter 16, I more focused on and did my research on how terrorist organizations are procuring these arms and explosives and how we can uh, prevent uh, these organizations. Next slide, please. I want to I wanna start first uh, getting your attention and raising, raising awareness on how many people are losing their lives and they're the casualty count in all over the world. I think also they are giving us some messages how these groups are uh, getting access to and also how it is critical you know, to prevent these organizations uh, procuring these arms and explosives. On the left side, you can see severity of incidents by casualties. By the way, these graphs are coming from uh, US Department of State Statistical Annex 2019 report. On the left side, you can see severity of incidents by casualties. I think uh, more than 80% uh, of incidents in, in the world, I mean terrorist attacks are recording some casualties. And uh, more than 40% are uh, maybe would be in the severe category because at least uh, six or under 10 people are losing their lives in the 40% of terrorist attacks, I think which makes around 2,500. As far as I know, terrorism databases are recording around eight or 9,000 incidents and every year. And uh, on the last uh, maybe graph, graph, you can see the casualty rate. I also tried to look at in my uh, research, uh, what groups are really deadly. Of course, there is no surprising uh, maybe result because we know that 
in the last uh, decades, the Salafi jihadist terrorist organizations have been the most deadliest terrorist organizations. And you can see here, ISIS and its franchises in all, all over the world have been the really the most deadliest terrorist organizations. When we, when we compare these ISIS groups or this jihadist uh, typology with other typologies, and we can see that the revolutionary groups like MPA or the Communist Party of India in or these next slide groups are uh, uh, less deadly is deadlier than this uh, jihadist organizations. In this graph, you can see weapon types because of course you can see different categories in different databases. And the, here firearms and explosives are the mostly used uh, weapon types in the world in 2019. In addition to both categories, you can see here incendiaries and the melee. And the melee, uh, I think we are not much familiar with what it is. It is handheld objects, whether blunt or bladed objects like bells, arrows, or the knives, uh, which, was, which has been used most uh, commonly in Africa. And also you can see unmanned aerial vehicle also is another weapon type. This is my last uh, graph. Also, uh, you can see here the weapon types by top uh, terrorist perpetrators. Taliban, ISIS, and uh, Al-Shabaab, they are more using these firearms and also IEDs and explosives. IEDs, improvised explosive devices, I think, I think also it's another indicator of terrorist organizations in capacity. On the right side, you can see Communist Party of India, which is more using, again, the firearms, and Boko Haram uh, dominantly is preferring to use firearms in, in its attacks. And also, as you know, Boko Haram has been one of the most deadliest organizations, and then uh, this organization is more using firearms. What are the types of arms and explosives? It's really a very confusing category, so many categories, but in my paper, in my research, in this handbook, I used more high-range weapons, medium-range, and the low-range categories. And high-range is, it's, I think, another topic for this handbook about CBRN, this WMD materials. Medium-range weapons used by terrorist organizations are more automatic weapons, rocket launchers, and the military-grade explosives. And the low-range low categories, including more homemade weapons like the uh, IEDs. And in addition to, uh, to this uh, big three categories, also you can see in the databases showing us uh, how terrorist organizations have been using fake weapons, incendiaries, melee weapons, vehicles, and the sabotage equipment, uh, also, also some others. Uh, we have seen that maybe uh, firearms and explosives, they have been mostly used categories. And uh, when we look at more specifically what these firearms and what these explosives are. They are light and heavy infantry weapons, assault rifles, rocket propelled grenades, uh, precision guided munitions are some types of uh, weapons used by terrorist organizations. When it comes to explosives, it can vary from crude homemade devices to advanced uh, commercial or military grade uh, devices and hand grenades, RPGs. Of course, also we know that in complex coordinated terrorist attack, it is one terrorist tactic, which is I think uh, happening in a reasonable time and space relationship. Maybe Easter attack or Paris attacks are some examples of the CCT attacks. I think in the world currently ISIS and there's some Al-Qaeda groups and uh, Taliban and Hamas have the capacity of doing this CCT attacks and they are mostly preferring to use RPGs also in their attacks. Bombs, of course, always have been one weapon type for these terrorist organizations and the Semtex and the composite C4 also are some other types. I think also we have seen the mines have been used in the conflict zones in Syria, in Latin America, also in Afghanistan, especially by Taliban. They are using these mines in their, in their attacks as well. Uh, and also in my paper, I try to detail the factors because I believe that uh, as long as we are addressing these factors, maybe we can, be really, uh, we can uh, stop these organizations getting access to these arms and explosives. So what is... Uh, leading to these terrorist, or terrorist groups to procure arms and explosives. I think maybe we need to speak about the role of states in sponsoring terrorism. We know well that some states, because of their maybe interest, they are behind some terrorist organizations and that they are procuring these arms and the weapons. Another factor which we need to do some analysis on the proxy wars, because in Yemen, Syria, and Libya, there have been many organizations, many fighting groups are operating. And interestingly, we know that some states, regardless of looking at whether they are jihadist terrorist organizations or they are rebels or militia groups, but we know that the surrogate organizations in Syria, Libya, or, or Yemen have been supported, sponsored, also have been uh, 
uh, provide some logistics as well as arms and explosives. Another factor maybe I would be suggesting to do some analysis on the porous borders. Of course, maybe we have seen Dr. Uh, maybe Sajal's uh, presentation, how it is really critical, also how people are moving from different borders and uh, maybe without having any obstacles. And uh, for example, in the, in the reports, you can see that how Al-Shabaab is enjoying maybe it's the, the porous border with Kenya, also in Nigeria, in the Sahel, in, in Syria. Also, you can see that how these terrorist organizations are enjoying and uh, having these porous borders. And then corruption, I think it's still another critical uh, factor because we know that uh, corruption is, is a facilitating factor for criminal and terrorist activities. And we know also well that in some uh, countries, in some regions, terrorist organizations, again, because of this corruption issue, they can transfer these arms and explosives through these customs as well. Another, I think, uh, factor we need to look at the linkages between or the convergence of criminal and terrorist networks. We know well that uh, terrorist organizations and criminal organizations, they collaborate uh, to each other. They talk to each other. So in the literature, also we have seen the nexus, uh, convergence, or dirty entanglement are some of the terms maybe telling us how both groups are collaborating to each other. But we know that this collaboration also is ending up uh, sometimes providing these terrorist organizations some arms and uh, explosives as well. Financial capacity of terrorist, or, terrorist groups, this is another, I think, factor. Uh, in this peak, I think in 2014 and 2015, we know that ISIS was the wealthiest terrorist organization, generating around $2 billion from its involvement in antiquities trafficking, uh, extortion, and as well as oil, oil smuggling. And think about the terrorist organization with like a large uh, revenue. So it is, it is not really difficult for these wealth organizations, again, to get access to, to these arms and explosives. Another one is weak law enforcement. I was the director of one international academy providing uh, training programs over 90 countries. Then I had a chance to see very closely to observe this law enforcement issue in many regions in the world. I think also in, in some reports, you can see that in Africa, in Africa, for example, terrorist organizations, they, they have better equipment, uh, equipped and also they have been using more technological weapons than uh, law enforcement or, or the military. Next one, please. Also in my uh, research, I try to do some comparisons and do some analysis on how different types of terrorist organizations are procuring arms and explosives. More specifically, my, my, my case studies included Taliban, ISIS, Iranian-backed groups, and Al-Shabaab. For example, for Taliban, you can see in the international reports, uh, states sponsoring terrorism are behind also uh, Taliban's arms and explosives. Of course, there should be some others, some other sources. We cannot limit just one or two here, but I just, again, want to raise awareness how it is really critical, you know, to address uh, the some factors, as I mentioned in the previous slide. ISIS, of course, in Syria, we know that wealthy businessmen uh, and also are maybe behind this funding and the financing of the, this organization. And also ISIS, uh, maybe some states, and also uh, it should be really critical for us to think about how ISIS you know, is maybe transferring the human beings, its militants, and also uh, its uh, arms and explosives. But mostly uh, we have seen that some states uh, targeting to over uh, overthrow Assad, then they are really behind this uh, organization in, in, in Syria. It is not difficult to guess who is behind this Hezbollah and also some other Iranian-backed groups in Iraq, uh, Syria, and Yemen. And we have seen the maybe Iranians, uh, Iranian involvement in procuring these arms and explosives uh, to, to these uh, terrorist groups in all over the world. For Al-Shabaab, I think uh, we have seen some Somalian police seizures and uh, some weapons, they were transferred from Yemen and Iran. Of course, this, this is not the only source for Al-Shabaab, also there are, there, are, there are some others. When I look at the next slide, please. When I look at uh, the revolutionary groups in the next slide, uh, of course, they're not, as I told you before, as deadly as the jihadist organizations, and, uh, but Communist Party of India, this next slide group, and also MPA, they have been always in the top 10 terrorist organizations with the most terrorist incidents. And how they are procuring, how they're getting access to these arms and explosives. For example, it's, 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 actually it's really much similar to each other. 
capturing or stealing from police and security forces, also uh, using underground arms market. This is for CPI. But when it comes to MPA, you can see again, looting after ambushes on the armed forces, stealing from military, military vehicles and the purchasing on the black market also is another source for this uh, Maoist group in the Philippines. And then the last slide. Uh, what we can do, actually, I'm not much optimistic because these are some ideal recommendations. I would be in favor of uh, maybe doing some or developing some policy models, more country or regional specific. But these are, as I said, some general recommendations. In the, on the government level, governmental level, uh, we need some legislative and policy changes and also strengthening the criminal justice response and increasing international cooperation and inter information exchange, exchange between states. I also try to detail these preventive uh, measures uh, based on upstream, midstream, and the downstream prevention. Also, here are some examples, good governance, democracy, rule of law, and the social justice, and the monitoring borders. Of course, the police and the military, they need better training to detect uh, the procurement of arms and explosives. It's really critical, vital uh, firearms identification because it creates effective record keeping of ownership of legal guns and their rifles. Of course, we should, I think we need to speak about this sanctions, it's really effective, and also the money transfers, because we know well that money transfers also are showing us uh, criminal networks or terrorist networks who are networked to each other. These are some really basic recommendations, but as I told you, I'm not really much optimistic seeing some uh, effective counterterrorism measures maybe aiming at the capacity of arms and explosives. So uh, that's why maybe the terrorism databases each year are recording around uh, 8,000 incidents and also 50,000 casualties killed and injured uh, these people. But it's really critical, uh, I think, to do something against the arms and explosive capacity of these terrorist organizations. Julia, thank you. Thank you very much, Doctor. Um, and you made my job easy in one of your slides. I think you really succinctly summed the links between the, the three different topics that, that you all spoke about today. The, uh, you know, the porousness of borders being a, you know, a contributing factor that enables groups to procure so many arms and explosives, um, as well as, of course, having sufficient financial resources to really obtain uh, a significant number uh, of, of arms as well. Um, so I think that really ties them together quite well. Um, and even though you ended uh, by saying you were are not overly optimistic about the, the potential options to sort of counter these things. I think that's something maybe we can dive into a bit more into in during the Q&A. Um, so quickly, before we do start with our questions, I want to, uh, again, remind uh, viewers, participants, you can continue to submit questions through the chat function. Um, and as well, at the end of our session today, uh, we will be putting a link to a survey in, in the uh, chat box. And we ask all of you if you can take just a few moments to fill that out and, and sort of let us know um, how the, the uh, session went today. It helps us uh, to sort of improve our future events. Um, but perhaps, yeah, we'll go ahead and um, start with some of the questions that we've had come in already. Um, perhaps I can uh, direct the first question uh, towards you, Jessica. You had mentioned um, briefly during your presentation talking about the impact that uh, the, the counter-terrorist financing regimes have on, on other actors, you know, perhaps civil society, NGOs, other entities. Could you maybe explore or explain a bit more about how, how that impact is, is working on the ground and what can be done to sort of counter the negative effects that the CFT regime has on, on groups who are not in fact uh, extremist organizations? Yeah, I think the two clearest impacts are on money remitters and on civil society, so nonprofit or charitable organizations. So we know that increasing regulations have made money transfers more expensive, have forced the enhanced regulation uh, of those money remitters. And to a certain extent, I think this has been a proportional response to terrorist financing, but there are consequences for particularly diaspora communities that need to be sending money home. Um, the other piece of that, of course, too, is the vilification of diaspora communities. When we see, you know, and then I'll go back to the example of Al-Shabaab again, you know, Al-Shabaab taxes a lot of the remittances that it gets, but in a lot of policy work and a lot of even academic work, people will talk about um, diaspora financing of a terrorist organization, and that's not what happens. That's not what's happening. Um, you know, there may be the odd uh, 
and small numbers of supporters in diaspora communities, but it's the taxation of those remittances. So there's a lot of conflation of terms in that space. And the other one is certainly in the nonprofit and charitable sector. Um, there is a FATF recommendation in terms of adopting a risk-based approach for these organizations that has uh, an impact in terms of their operations. They need to then understand what a risk-based approach is. They need to be implementing um, monitoring, reporting mechanisms, all these kinds of things, um, which have a cost as well. And a lot of them do work in really sensitive conflict zone areas. So it can make their, their operations more difficult. Again, somewhat proportional response, but there's also other impacts like um, cracking down on civil society organizations that are seen to be in opposition to more author authoritarian regimes through the finance, the counter-terrorist financing provisions and under that cover. So there's a lot of different externalities or impacts that I don't think were necessarily anticipated when, you know, really back in, in on 9-11, just after 2001. Thank you, Jessica. Um, picking up on your point about sort of a, a proportional response, maybe I'll direct the next question to you, Sajan. Um, you know, in terms of um, how how these sort of waves of migrants are regarded, you you had mentioned sort of uh, when extremist actors embed themselves in in people who are seeking genuine refuge. Um, you know, maybe you could talk a little bit more about how that dynamic plays out in some of the regions that you had looked at uh, within your your case studies in your chapter. Is it, for example? Um, uh, you know, the same if we're talking about those who are coming uh, through Turkey into Europe as those who are coming perhaps uh, to, to border regions in Pakistan and India or Pakistan and Afghanistan. So it's a very um, interesting question. It does vary, uh, but nevertheless, sometimes the, the motivations for the terrorists is the end goal, which is to, to carry out the attack, or it is to plot and plan and, and recruit individuals. We, in the case of, say, for example, uh, ISIS, who was sending fighters within the, the migrant trails from uh, Syria across to, to Europe, uh, they were smuggling in their people with the purposes of carrying out mass casualty attacks. We've seen in the case of North Africa, where you have, for example, the ISIS affiliates that operate in the Maghreb, in the Sahel, they are involved in human trafficking and sex trafficking. And they, for them, it's about making money. And occasionally it can also be about moving terrorists across. And the third example that I would think of is the issue to do with Afghanistan, Pakistan, and that the Taliban themselves very much are dependent on, to a degree, uh, complicity from uh, Pakistani border guards. Uh, somewhat at times there's negligence uh, as well. Uh, but I think what's disturbing to sometimes is the fact that how brazen some of these terrorists are. Yes, to a degree, they want to hide that and mask their activities. But on the other hand, some of them are very open about it. And I even brag about the fact that they are able to penetrate through security or that they get support sometimes from individuals that could be corrupted or even ideologically uh, supportive. So. It's concerning. And I think that perhaps once COVID-19 can be addressed and the, 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 that, that damage is, is reduced and travel starts up again, it will be important to observe what the consequences have been with the fact that we've not been able to monitor as much as we could uh, previously and how have those uh, trafficking and, and, and terrorist operations altered when it comes to plotting and planning. Thank you. I might actually uh, direct another question towards you immediately. Um, you know, particularly speaking about how brazen some of these individuals are. Uh, why haven't they tried to exploit exploit more the the southwestern border in the United States? Um, it's of course a big talking point in the media, but because we haven't actually seen that happen, um, do you have any thoughts on why that is, and what is preventing um, individuals from sort of uh, taking advantage of that border in particular? So it's a very um, emotive question, I, I think, uh, because, and it's a very important one too, because it, it kept coming up in my research and in my discussions with people, because there are some that are adamant that this uh, border between the US and Mexico is potentially being used by uh, terrorists and, and extremists. 
What I would say is, is that we've seen examples of what are called special interest aliens, SIA, and the term may well be changing under the Biden administration, but special interest aliens could be individuals that have got a connection to some entity that could be prescribed or of concern or on the radar, but they're not necessarily traveling for the purposes of terrorism. There was one example I can recall uh, where there was the attack in Edmonton where an Edmonton a police officer was hit by a vehicle and then uh, stabbed in, in, in the head and miraculously, thankfully he survived. The individual who swore allegiance to uh, ISIS came through the US-Mexico border, but that was not his intention at that time. He got recruited and radicalized later. And very often, sometimes these issues become political. I would say that you can't rule it out. It is definitely a potential possibility that you could see terrorists using that border route, but they would have to also then cooperate with some of the criminal enterprises, the drug cartels. And at the moment, there is just not enough evidence to show that there is that symbiotic relationship. Although, watch this space, you never know what could happen in, in the future. Thank you indeed. I think we're all watching the, the crime terror nexus and how that will unfold in the coming years. Um, perhaps uh, uh, to Mahmoud, if I could uh, throw a question your way. Um, there's been a question about uh, when, when charitable or sort of social welfare activities are part of uh, you know, part and parcel of the activities of terrorist organizations, you know, thinking of a Hamas as a really um, uh, strong example of that. Um, you know, how, how can that particularly be countered? Because of course, you know, the two are so intrinsically linked. Do you have any thoughts on, on how, um, how to prevent the, the terrorist side of their activities while at the same time not causing detriment to the populations by stopping or, or eliminating the, the services that they're um, providing? I think a great question, Julie. Maybe it's not only one of the biggest challenges in terrorism area, because there is no generally accepted, uh, also there is no consensus on the definition of terrorism. I think we have seen the, the, we have seen the same story once maybe terrorists is another freedom fighters. Actually Hamas also, I think is, is represented by a political party like Hezbollah in Lebanon. So these groups, they had maybe there is a majority of group of people which they are not seeing this Hamas or Hezbollah or some other ones as terrorist organizations. So that's why we can see these social welfare activities and then maybe they are, uh, they are behind maybe funding and also financing these, these organizations. Actually, it, it's been the reason in also in Syria as well or in Yemen, because everybody knows that this Houthis in Yemen or the ISIS or Al Qaeda groups in Syria they have been really the deadliest groups, also they are really killing the civilians. But when it comes to how these groups have been perceived also by some others, but unfortunately I can tell you that in the world we are not on the same page because uh, misperception, sometimes ideological element, then these groups, these groups, they cannot be seen as terrorist organizations. Then that's why these groups are enjoying, you know, some uh, open donations, also charities, as well as the social welfare programs and the uh, funding also financing these organizations. I think it is more related to uh, how we are approaching this issue, uh, Julia, maybe also more related to some definitional issues, also more related to uh, why we are not on the same page when it comes to doing something or seeing these organizations, violent groups as terrorist organizations. Thank you. I, I might uh, immediately also ask you a second question here before uh, jumping uh, perhaps back to Jessica. Um, you know, you, you spoke in your presentation about how uh, some of these groups are obtaining arms um, either through being sold uh, these by military actors or, or perhaps just uh, confiscating or stealing or otherwise obtaining them without the consent of the military. Um, but with such a, a militarized or securitized approach to countering terrorism, how do we how do we stop that as one avenue that these groups are able to obtain arms? Um, you know, it seems like more more military force is being used rather than less. Um, so how do we stop these these really um, advanced technologies in many cases from falling into the hands of these actors? If, if I go back to you know, my slide on the factors, that's why you know I, I was trying to detail this endemic corruption issue and the big law, law enforcement uh, issue. In the world, we have, we have, we have known that, for example, Al-Shabaab also, some Somali military personnel, they are more individual cases, but they are 
maybe selling these weapons or arms to to this uh, Al Shabaab terrorist organization. I, I'm sure there should be some others in Africa or in the Middle East, and the selling of these weapons by uh, governmental officials to these organizations. I think again, it is more related to uh, corruption issue. Uh, of, of course, we know that uh, corruption is not a day and night issue, so it is only a culture. It takes only long years, you know, maybe to to curb or to fix corruption issue. As long as you are not fixing corruption issue in any law enforcement or military, I don't think that you know we, we will be uh, hearing also seeing this this kind of maybe sales like corruption issues and the terrorist organizations they will be again enjoying you know uh, having or having this opportunity to buy some weapons from the some uh, military or law enforcement and also i try to detail my research on it's been really common to see uh, loadings stealings or again buying these weapons in india also in, in the philippines uh, if you look at the corruption perception index in the world, I think it can give us some some clues, some messages that what countries they can be having such kind of issues like these dirty relationships between the law enforcement and the, the terrorist organizations. Thank you. Yep, uh, quite a quite a insurmountable maybe a uh, challenge to deal with such endemic corruption, which yeah, of course, is a, a huge contributing factor. Um, I might, yeah, as I mentioned, jump jump back to you, Jessica. Um, you know, I think there was a common theme throughout your, all three of you sort of mentioned, uh, you know, failure to share information or failure to have effective cooperation as being sort of one of the key challenges. Um, but perhaps, uh, Jessica, I would ask you about the private sector. So banks, financial institutions, their reluctance to share information in some regards is, is you know, perhaps one of these sort of barriers. Um, do you think that there needs to be some sort of obligation or, or requirement that they indeed sort of engage more fully and share uh, the information that they're otherwise perhaps a little bit reluctant to disclose? And, and would that indeed be, be helpful um, in terms of uh, CFT? Yeah, that's a, there's, a lot, there's a lot there in that question, actually. So um, the first thing I would say is that most banks that I've worked with are not reluctant to share information. If they think that they have information that's relevant to a terrorist financing or terrorism investigation, they're very, they re really want to share it. They actually want to get it off uh, their books and be seen to be doing something proactive about it. The difficult thing here, though, is that <clears throat> terrorist financing is a small data problem. So unlike money laundering, where you can develop robust typologies based on huge amounts of data, the same is not true for terrorist financing. And terrorist financing tactics in terms of um, how they're moving money, why they're moving money change quite quickly, um, particularly for the size of data set that we have. So it's very difficult to develop good rules effectively for detection of terrorist financing. So when we turn to the private sector and say, we need you to be better at detecting terrorist financing, they then turn around and say to us, yes, but how? And then it's very difficult to tell them exactly how to do that. Um, so I don't necessarily think that the private sector is the issue. I think better partnership with the private sector is an important piece. So um, there are a number of really good examples of public-private partnerships. There are a lot of challenges though, in terms of you know, privacy legislation, um, sharing of information between institutions can also be a challenge. So there's a lot of little things to unpack there, but I would say that more regulation or more um, coercion in terms of forcing the private sector to do more in the terrorist financing space isn't necessarily where we wanna go. Thank you, Jessica. That was uh, really, really illustrative because I think uh, most of us who are not within the CFT space, I think have this um, immediate assumption that it is in fact the private sector who are resistant to this, to this cooperation and information sharing. So it's very informative to find out that that's indeed not the case. Um, perhaps that'll uh, link into to a, a follow up question I have that maybe I'll open to to all three of you, um, you know, whoever would be interested to respond. Um, we see some instances where governments, um, you know, are, are recipients of information that they, they for whatever reason, don't act upon. So I'm thinking of with the Austrian government receiving information related to the Vienna attacker from last year that he had tried to procure, procure ammunition um, in Slovakia. 
and and so the Austrians were notified by the Slovakian authorities, and it seems didn't take action um, to to sort of interact with this individual and to ultimately prevent the attack. Whereas we have other instances where, for example, the the planned attack in Albania on, on a football match, um, information was shared by the Israeli authorities, and the Albanian authorities did indeed act and prevent that uh, attack from taking place. So I wanted to ask the three of you if if you see any trends or any overall commonality is on when, when does cooperation or information sharing break down and when does that become a, a problem versus when do you see it working effectively and what conditions need to be there to make sure that the sort of links either between you know borders and weapons and financing, when does that all come together to allow institutions and governments to act effectively and, and when does it not? So a very broad question, but perhaps, um, I don't know if, if, if one of you three want to start. And Jessica, please. Yeah, so I'll draw a little bit on my practical experience to answer this question. So the ways in which I've seen information sharing relationships break down, um, a lot of it has to do with how the information is presented and the receiving jurisdiction's interpretation of that information. So, um, you know, back, in, back when I was working in the intelligence business, if I was presented with a piece of information that said that somebody was linked to somebody else, the imprecision of that language was a real impediment to my action because linked could mean anything. I'm linked to everybody in this Zoom meeting right now. Is that the extent of the relationship or is it much more substantive? So when the information isn't presented in a really clear way, that's a problem. When the source of the information isn't um, clearly described and the reliability can also be an issue, that's also a problem. In other cases, you know, you'll have states reporting information that isn't actually a crime in your jurisdiction. So there's very little that you can do with it. Maybe it becomes a back piece of background information. And then the last thing that I'll say is just the volume of information that law enforcement and security services get. Um, so if you're wading through a bunch of vaguely worded reports, it becomes very difficult to know which ones to act on, which ones to prioritize, which ones to ingest into your system, which ones to discard. So those are some of the big ways that I've seen information sharing break down practically. Perhaps I could add to that. Um, I think Jessica's laid it out very well. It's, it's interesting and disturbing that this is going to be the 20th year since the 9-11 the attacks. And we're still having this conversation about improving information sharing and cooperation. So it shows you that there has been progress, but there are challenges. And I think Julie brought in the interesting example of the cooperation between Israel and Albania. Uh, if you look at the fact that very much the sharing of information comes down to the, the, the structure of the organizations, but it also comes down to the ethos and how dependent they are and how important it is to share that information. Uh, that how will that impact on them economically, politically, socially? If you look at the cases of say Singapore, who have been very much in the forefront of information sharing, for them, it's a, a necessity because otherwise it could cost not just lives, but it could hurt their economy uh, as well. I think one of the problems also tends to be is that some countries, some agencies view information as a sort of almost valuable personal tool and are reluctant to pass that information on. Or there's often what I was mentioning in, in my presentation is sometimes there is complicity uh, as well because sometimes certain uh, governmental bodies, certain intelligence agencies may have sympathies or strategic agendas with particular terrorist groups. So those unfortunately tend to be uh, the problems and the challenges. And I just hope that with each attack, lessons can be learned so that you don't end up having the same situation. Because as you mentioned, the example of the Austria attack, really there were a lot of gaps there uh, and, and things that could have been avoided uh, to prevent that uh, horrific uh, event from unfolding. Thank you. And uh, Mahmoud, I don't know if you uh, would like to jump in on that question as well. Very brief to know. Uh, uh, you're on mute. Okay. I, I, actually, we have seen you know, this, this issue of intelligence squabbling because we have seen some critics, this intelligence sharing, uh, especially during 9-11. Also, we know that uh, it's been another issue, you know, sharing versus hoarding the information. But uh, Maybe I think there are different uh, maybe 
problems, issues, maybe in the Western world, maybe information sharing might be issue, but when we look at other parts of the world, Africa and the Middle East, actually, I'm trying to give some examples from the Middle East. I did some field research. I was there five years in the border areas, Turkey and Syria and Turkey and Iran. So I was close to observing uh, how it is a really big issue because I have seen that the police, they don't talk to each other. Uh, but I think maybe beyond sharing information, there are some really main issues like this cooperation issues. That's why, you know, I was telling in the last slide that there are many things we, we need to do to, to be more effective against these uh, terrorist organizations. Thank you very much. Um, all, all three of our panelists today, I think it's been a really, really fruitful discussion and certainly incredibly interesting. And I apologize to, to those who submitted questions. We were unfortunately, as always is the case, unable to get to all of them. Um, but I believe that the, the other breakout group is going to be rejoining us, uh, I think momentarily or as we speak. Um, so I think we'll leave it there uh, and I will turn it over to Alexander again. Hello everyone, uh, nice to see uh, everyone back in, in the main room. I know uh, in the breakout room we had quite interesting presentations and a couple of thoughtful questions. I heard uh, on the side chats here that similar things are happening in the main room. So I look forward to uh, getting that de uh, debrief after the event. Um, recognizing we've just got a couple of minutes here. I firstly, of course, wanted to, on behalf of ICCT, since I had a, a technical glitch at the beginning, just say thank you very much to all of the amazing experts that we heard from here today. Um, yeah, I know that the, the handbook has been a love, uh, a labor of love for many of you for, for some time, and we're really excited to give you the floor here today to express those ideas and to get some direct engagement with the community of ICCT's policymakers, practitioners, and academic and students. So I hope that that was enjoyable for you. Um, yeah, I wanted to make two closing remarks. Number one, uh, as we've talked about at the beginning, this is the third in a in a multi-part series. So I would very much encourage you if you would like to hear uh, further chapters, uh, further authors, uh, please do sign up to the ICCT newsletter uh, where you will get notified of the next events and other things that we do, uh, other research we publish and the like. Um, the second thing, and I think you've just received it in your chat, uh, that we do try to really work on, I guess, making these events impactful and meaningful for those that spend the time with us, you know, this is an hour and a half of your time uh, today. And the way we can do better at that is by simply asking you a short set of questions. So in the chat function, you have a link to a three question survey it takes less than a minute to do. Just giving it an indication of what we've done well here today, where we can do better and if the work was impactful to you. And we will use that information, that feedback to help tailor future sessions and, uh, future sessions and, and make uh, just a little bit better every time is our objective. So please take a second as you exit here to fill that out and help us make uh, the next event um, yeah, even, even stronger. Um, lastly, I, I just wanted to say again, Professor Schmidt, thank you very much. I'll give you the floor to, to close out if you have any final remarks you'd love to, uh, to leave the, the session with. I'm afraid you're uh, on mute here for us. Shall we try? Uh... <laughs> We're gonna see if we can unmute him here. He's clearly got some uh, thoughtful remarks. <laughs> uh, you might take the floor, I think. Alex. I think so, yeah. I think then, unfortunately, uh, Professor Schmidt, you were on mute there. I, I think you hear us now. Can you unmute yourself and then uh, you uh, just repeat that last closing remark? <laughs> Sorry for that. No I worries. don't know how this happened by changing <laughs> the rule. But uh, my, I said that, uh, regretfully, we could not follow both sessions at the same time. But there is the opportunity afterwards to watch the whole thing on video at a time of your convenience. I'm glad that we had, uh, again, uh, attentive audiences. And if you had questions, but no chance to answer it, uh, to get it uh, posted and to have it answered, feel free to send us an email and we can uh, use uh, that more traditional form to answer in more details. In fact, I prefer to uh, deal with things in a written form because writing sharpens your mind more than a simultaneous uh, extempore speech. <laughs> so that is my preferred form of communication. 
I look very much forward to see you again back when we present part four, which is even larger with 10 authors and chapters in about six to eight weeks uh, time. And uh, as we progress, uh, we uh, hope that uh, the technicalities, uh, mute, unmute, will uh, gradually be mastered by everybody <laughs> and uh, so that the conversation will be smoother. But uh, to be honest, I also look forward to the day when we have real conferences with real live people at real places and <laughs> afterwards a good chat and a drink. So thank you for being with here and I see you next time. Bye bye. Cheers for that. Thank Thanks you very again. much. <laughs> bye bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Have a great day. Thank you.